Good afternoon, Jonathan. Thanks for coming on today. Hi, Jason. How are you? I have Jonathan Tampkin with me today, the founder and managing partner of Tampkin and Hotchberg. They're located out in Newton. And Jonathan, I know you have a lot of business experience in terms of being a business lawyer. Not only were you in-house counsel before, but you have you represent a lot of business owners now um, in many different capacities. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge. It's, it's my pleasure. It's good to see you, good to talk to you, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. So Jonathan, obviously you know that I practice a lot of white collar criminal defense. And not to really talk about that, but in a world where we're probably going to see a lot of opportunities. And I know a lot of people are coming to you to kind of talk about buying companies, selling companies, and just different things. How do you advise your clients to avoid a situation where they may be engaged with a or trying to buy a company that may not really be above board, right? What are the things that you kind of put in in terms of like a contract, in terms of due diligence? What's the process in terms of protecting your clients who are running a legitimate business, looking into buying a business? What are the things that you advise them to protect them to make sure that they're not buying something that is not what they bargained for? So obviously, uh, Jason, it starts with the type of business in the industry. So let's talk about two examples. One would be a pervasively regulated industry. It could be food, it could be pharmaceuticals, or it could be uh, pharmacy, it could be medical, it could be dental. They're regulated by state and federal boards, the acronyms, the FCC, the FTC, the ABCC, a lot of acronyms. Um, and you want to do it early on in your review of a potential business in those regulated industries is check the record, see on their background, see if there are any issues related to their licensure, claims against the professional. So in medical practice, it's the uh, claims for Medicaid fraud or any type of other disciplinary provisions and a uh, restaurant or a licensed establishment, the ABCC Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission or the state or the local licensing board to see if there's any issues there. The primary problem in buying a restaurant or licensed establishment right. is unfortunately many of these principals and owners don't, they have two sets of books. So basically it's a cash business and they're not reporting uh, all their income. So, so what happens is if, if one of those establishments is going for a loan, they can't produce that income or if they're going to a sale, they can't that income to the prospective buyer to show that the, 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 the business is worth what they're looking for. So we always counsel our clients. Everything's above boards. Everything has to be transparent because it's going to come back and bite you at some point, uh, either for a bank not giving you a loan, a buyer not giving you your sale price, or the regula regulators uh, not being happy with what you're not disclosing. And that's the IRS, the DOR, or any other regulatory body. So that type of business, you dig into their backgrounds in the context of due diligence and any asset or stock deal you have 30, 60, 90 days to examine. And prior to making an offer on a business, you're probably doing that due diligence in advance. So that's those types of businesses. Um, and then there are other types of businesses where uh, they're not pervasively regulated. However, you don't know how they're operating. So you, you have a very good forensic accountant to review the financials that they're presenting to you, the balance sheets, the profit and loss statements, and the tax returns. And generally, if you're very insightful in what people do, you can see what people are doing, the legitimate tax deductions, the legitimate sources of income, and the gray areas where a good accountant or CPA will take a an aggressive position and then things that are just not legit. Yeah. One of those areas really is employees and employment. And as you know, the independent contractor issue. Yes. 1099s versus the W-2 wages. Right. So those so, those are two ways. So what what type of things do you do in terms of trying to clear that issue up prior to purchase? Or do you advise your client that that may not be the best purchase for them if they are misclassifying employees? Well, you're doing one or two things. You can still buy a, a business where the seller is not doing everything that you would advise your client or that your client would do. You have to have in protections, which are significant holdbacks and escrows, indemnification provisions, uh, 
spelled out on the warranties representations and have them warrant to you and represent to you. It affects the price. You can buy assets without liabilities. Sometimes they're so significant, you don't want to step into the mess. You have to make that educated decision. So nothing is that bad or that horrible if it's a legitimate business and the business owners are, are being aggressive. But you have to evaluate it and then it hits you upside the head of when something is to run away from rather than walk away from. Well, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing about you and, and why you are valuable is that most entrepreneurs want to get through this, this, the system and get it done quickly without really thinking about the consequences. But obviously, when problems come up, you're the first call they get and you, that, that you're going to get is from them to say, well, these are the issues that are coming up. What is a typical time frame for a business to be sold in terms of with all the due diligence? How long does it usually take? It depends on the season. It depends on the market. It depends on whether we have a global pandemic. So I have deals that were working through Q3 and Q4 2020, and I have one closing tomorrow finally. And that was supposed to close by the end of 2020. Then there's one that just popped up three weeks ago and it was rapid. So the general frame is from the time a party is interested and submits a letter of intent or an offer uh, to the time they finish their due diligence and an asset or stock purchase agreement that's executed in closing is probably 60 to 90 days. Okay. Uh, that's a typical medium sized deal, bigger deals with lots of intricate, multiple employees, huge revenues, it obviously extends out. Right, right, right. Now, Jonathan, I know that's not the only thing that you do. You obviously do a lot of business transactions in that way in terms of buying and selling businesses. But can you tell us a little bit about the other areas that you, that people should call you and, and go to your website and give you a call on this phone number? Sure. So my practice is basically two, two buckets. The first thing is general corporate business transactions. I'm outside corporate counsel to a lot of businesses. So I'm the go-to person as their trusted counselor on all sorts of things. And that involves transitions, succession planning, buy-sell agreements between owners and acquisitions or dispositions of their business. It also involves employment situations, uh, leasing, licensing, uh, intellectual property, everything that's involved in the business. And the other side kind of strangely is is commercial real estate. So I, I, I'm involved in transactions dealing with the buying, selling, developing, and leasing of uh, property, commercial property primarily, although we've done residential a lot of it. Uh, I was an in-house counsel for a number of years, and I had three areas, general corporate and business, commercial real estate, and I did securities work. Uh, I don't find the securities work in Newton in my office now. We're a smaller firm. We're about eight or nine lawyers. So I sort of gave up the securities and it's something you have to always involve yourself. So anything that a business owner may need, we generally handle. We handle the litigation, we handle construction, we handle zoning and a le lot of leasing and uh, buying and selling commercial property. So those are really two buckets. Many people who are involved with real estate are not involved in business and corporate. Many people involved in business and corporate involved in real estate and they have departments in larger firms. Both myself and one of my law partners came from large corporations. He was a tax and corporate attorney in a large uh, corporation as well. So that's how we started our firm. We're in our 26th year. Wow. Uh, 25th year was not a good year for a celebration. That was last year. So we're hoping to have our, our 25th anniversary this year in our 26th year. So two different things. One, I'd love you to come back to give us some um, tips about just avoiding fraud in the commercial real estate space next time. Um, but also, I know every time that I sent someone to you, they speak so glowing of, glowingly of you because your attention to detail, you know, and the way that you're able to, they're like, you can pick up the phone, call Jonathan, it's a one phone call, he'll know the answer, and he'll kind of slow us down, and, and the, your attention to detail is second to none. And that's important for these individuals, right? Because you have individuals that may, especially during this time, they may have never seen the business. They may not be in this state trying to buy a business and to have someone who's seasoned and really knows what they're doing and knows where the pitfalls to protect them. And I think that's why people love having you as their attorney. So um, thank you for taking care of all the people that I've sent over. I mean, the people I sent over obviously are in Massachusetts, but I could definitely see how valuable you are and how glowingly people speaking of you 
uh, just because of the immense knowledge that you have. So I really appreciate all that. Well, that's that's very nice. And every client that you refer to me, uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, collaborating with other lawyers in the area, uh, people who are neighbors and friends, and I think the world of you, Jason. Thank you very much. I, I think the thing, how it relates to your practice, is the disconnect an entrepreneur has in a pervasively regulated industry. Right. So the entrepreneur is a risk taker, or many of them are. And a pervasively regulated industry doesn't allow that level of risk. Correct. You can take risk with economics, but not sort of bending the rules. So that's where people get in trouble. And uh, in my experience, there is uh, a crossroads in life, uh, and that is in business and law, that you take one way, you take the other way. And one may be vast riches, and may be more the, the, the slow and steady. Uh, and you've got to be careful what you're doing. So uh, there's some people who are ill-suited to any type of regulated industry. Uh, and you got to be careful like that. Finance, uh, banking, yeah. you talked about the real estate industry and, and the mortgage industry. And the moral of the story, Jason, is transparency and honesty and ethics. Yeah. And that can't hurt you. You may not make all the money you think, but <laughs> you, you're doing the right thing. And in the end, all you have is your reputation in life. Got to play the long game. So, Jonathan, I'm going to go through our last section, which is the most difficult for you. Okay. Right. So, I got two questions. One, who do you think is going to win the Frozen Four this year? Okay, that's number one. I know you're a big hockey guy. Number two, give me an underdog that you think is going to go far. But they're probably not going to win the whole thing, but give me an underdog. Well, I will say that UMass Amherst is going to win the Frozen Four. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying that. Uh, <laughs> except I'm a huge UMass uh, alum and fan, uh, I think they I, they couldn't set it up better to play Minnesota Duluth for a rematch from two years ago when we were all in Buffalo watching that game. I think they had a chance with Minnesota Duluth two years ago. Bobby Trevino couldn't play and getting into the weeds because uh, he was suspended from that final game and they played in overtime the night before. In any event, uh, UMass Amherst, I would perceive as the underdog because there's three Minnesota teams against one mass team. So I would say Minnesota uh, is going to lose out and UMass Amherst will be the underdog in the national championship as of next Saturday night. Not this Saturday night, Saturday the 10th. Sounds great. Well, Jonathan, thanks for coming on and I hope you come back again soon. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you so much.